again, Chair. Uh, apologies for that. We're back live. Okay, so we got as far as apologies, didn't we? And we say we have one apology, De Jenna. <clears throat> An apology you, from yeah. Councillor Loftus, yes. Okay, and no news from Sue yet, Jenna. Can you all hear me? Have I gone quiet now, Jenna? I can hear you, Chris. Oh, that's good. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, so I can only see a few people in front of me, colleagues, on the screen. So please, if you want to comment or speak at any time, and that's including, I understand, we have uh, Councillor Matty Ross and Leader of Council with us. So welcome, Matty. Welcome, Doina. If you want to contribute anyway, just please indicate, and I'm, and I'm sure we can, uh, we can let you into the meeting at some stage. Okay. So we got to declarations of interest. Has anybody got any declarations of interest? If so, please raise a hand. I'm not seeing any. So next, I want to move on to the minutes of the 23rd of January. Is there somebody who'd like to move those minutes for me, please? Thank you, Gordon. Is there a second there? I can't see a second there. Ken, you're second in. Thank you, Ken. Okay, so I'm assuming colleagues, um, we're all in favor of those minutes. So happy to take them is, uh, is accurate. Lovely, thank you for that. Okay, wonderful. Okay, public questions. I understand we have no public questions. So we can now move on to item number five, and that's where we invite Chris to come and talk to us and give us an update on the Police and Crime Commission's annual update. Over to you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. It's always a pleasure to uh, to be here at Stroud District Council, even though we're all, most of us doing it virtually. Um, when I was told uh, about the meeting, I was given a, a number of things to talk about or suggestions. So um, if, if OK with you, Chair, I'll touch upon Safer Gloucestershire, which people do know I'm Chair of Safer Gloucestershire. Uh, I'll also talk about the uh, Black Lives Matter and some of the uh, fallout from that and future. Um, a bit about COVID, uh, some of the policing, and then a little bit about the refresh of the policing crime plan. I'll try and keep it as brief as possible because I know you've got a, a, a bit of a clock. How long have I got out of interest? Because I can talk for England, as you know. Yeah, about 10 minutes, Chris. Could you get it in in 10 minutes? I'll, I'll, I'll speed ahead and I'm happy to take questions at the end if, that, if you're yes, happy. That, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, in terms of Safer Gloucestershire, many will, uh, will know that this came into fruition by 2017 out of the county's uh, devolution bid. Uh, I took over the chairmanship of Safer Gloucestershire in 2018. Um, it's to provide a kind of strategic oversight for community safety in the, in the county. And I think over the last year, we've made some really good inroads uh, because of COVID, like many things, uh, the actual regular meetings were postponed. Uh, but that doesn't mean work stopped. And actually, in some respects, I was quite glad you postponed your meeting uh, last month and delayed it to today because, in fact, I was writing my annual report for Safer Gloucestershire. So it's uh, fresh in my mind. Um, so I'm just going to go through quickly in terms of uh, what Safer Gloucestershire has done over the last year, just for a bit of awareness, really. And one of the great things that think, I think Safer Gloucestershire has, has brought to the table is around domestic homicide reviews. Um, we've got one uh, just about to start in Stroud. Um, this, uh, I think, one of the things that Safer Gloucestershire has done, working with partners, is to give a bit of uh, kind of join up across the county with regards to uh, DHRs, because they can take a lot of time uh, and they're quite uh, they're hard work. And one of the things that we've done, we've, there's a good protocol between districts uh, and uh, Safer Gloucestershire. Um, we have a list of designated chairs. We have uh, the DASV coordinator in the county who supports um, Mike and Nikki Humphreys at, at uh, your uh, strategic council. Um, so I'm really pleased with the fact that over the, um, the way this has developed has given a bit of coordination across the county. And actually, sometimes that's really helpful because when you follow up DHRs, um, there's always lessons to be learned. And sometimes we haven't really picked up on that, I think, as a county, because if, if there's a, a DHR in Stroud or Cheltenham or Gloucester, sometimes we haven't had that kind of join up. So that's one of the good things, I think, of having an overarching uh, board. Just for awareness, we've got currently uh, four domestic homicide reviews uh, in the county. Two have been signed off and submitted to the Home Office. One is currently being uh, finalised and there's a further one, as you said, just begun in uh, Stroud. There is an, also another one, I believe, underway in Cheltenham. Um, Antisocial behaviour. 
uh, I'll pick up on this because I know for many of you as local councillors, this is probably one that you get a lot of uh, mail on or correspondence from uh, residents. I do believe as a county, we probably need to do more with regards to ASB. And I think actually Safe for Gloucestershire is a, a forum that can help coordinate some of that. So one of the things that we've done throughout um, lockdown, many of you, if you attend your own CSPs, uh, former Chief Inspector Richard Burge, we asked him to do some work for the, for the OPCC at the beginning of January with regards to burglary. But when COVID hit, we asked him to take on a bit of a coordinating role attending all the CSPs in the county on behalf of Martin and myself and the office. And uh, we've just appointed him to be our Safer Days, and, Safer Days and Nights lead for the Policing Crime Plan because being a former chief inspector, his background setting up Gloucester City Safe and Stroud Safe as well. He's got a real kind of background knowledge that I think would be really, really helpful going forward. So one of the things I've asked him to do working with the police and CSPs is to look at the issue of ASB in the county, whether that's the stuff that uh, councils deal with, like fly tipping, environmental uh, ASB, to the more serious stuff where the police need involvement. There is something called the use of the community trigger. I know uh, uh, Councillor Robinson uh, is on the line today. I know, Steve, you've mentioned that to me previously. One of the things that the community trigger enables uh, uh, to happen is the voice of the public when it comes to um, ASB. And I don't think we've heard enough of the voice of the public when we've looked at antisocial behaviour in the county. Um, for instance, just over uh, the kind of lockdown period, there was a number of ASB incidents going on in, in Colford and in other areas where I was getting feedback and I would then chase the police and find out what was going on. And from behind the scenes, there was a good multi-agency response. But if the public don't see that and feel that, they sometimes don't feel they're being listened to. So the community trigger gives the voice to the public. So what I've commissioned is some work on behalf of Safer Gloucestershire, which will come back to the districts to basically have a, a greater join up with regards to how we deal with ASB as a county, how we report it and also the kind of other options. So how do you get a community trigger activated? And also how do you uh, kind of help mediate? Because it's not always the role of the police or councils. You can have some low level antisocial behavior that can be dealt with by mediation. And one of the things that many people don't know is that we actually uh, fund a hotline as part of our victims contract with victim support that offers a dedicated antisocial beha anti behavior hotline for the county. So I think ASB in the next year will be a, a real focus for uh, Safer for Gloucestershire. Um, Violence prevention, um, I was quite keen that we pushed this as a county a few years ago. When it comes to violence in our county, we are a safe county. You know, we're, we're not in a city, London. We don't have huge amounts of problems with knife crime or, or violence against the person, although it is going up. So um, we commissioned some work, uh, which we paid for a role within uh, Gloucestershire County Council in the public health department. Um, we did the largest ever mapping and scoping out exercise of violence in the county. And what's come out of that has been some extra commissioning of services between GCC, the PCC's office and others. And hopefully because of COVID, we delayed a bit of an educational campaign that will come out probably early next year now. Um, social isolation is another topic about resilient communities. This is a joint uh, Safer Gloucestershire and Health and Wellbeing Board priority. This is being led by the Enabling Active Communities. I'm heavily involved with that. It's early days because of, of COVID. We've paused a bit of the work. Um, Drugs and alcohol, always a, 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 in any community safety strategy, you always have to have something about drugs and alcohol because it's one of the drivers, as we know. Uh, currently, the County Council are doing a bit of a review on that one for Safer Gloucestershire. So that will be, again, another thing that uh, comes back. Uh, burglary, we had a bit of a spike in burglary a few years ago, especially in places like Cheltenham, even though Stroud had a bit of an issue recently. Um, some more... Uh, proactive work is going on with regards to burglary and I know that the police are in discussions with the fire and rescue service about how we can involve the fire service a bit more in that one and finally with regards to Safer Gloucestershire um, I'm hoping at some point uh, end of this year beginning of next year to do a full county-wide survey involving all the district council CSPs and Safer Gloucestershire to really get a sense from what the public think about community safety because one of the key issues that you find in a place like Gloucestershire which is relatively safe is sometimes the perception and fear of crime out ways the reality and it's how do we kind of balance those two so what i'd like to actually get do is a proper county-wide survey so i want district csps to feed into that what kind of questions do you want to ask of the public so that will hopefully lead into a community safety conference early next year and then a refresh of safer gloucestershire going forward so i'll pause and say for gloucestershire is there any questions with regards to that before i go on to um black lives matter and the pcc's office Okay, colleagues, have you got any questions for Chris so far? 
you can show. Happy for Chris to continue then? Councillor Tipper, Chair. Right, okay, Hi. Brian. Yes, um, good evening, Chris. Good evening. Um, good evening, Brian. Um, perhaps you might um, uh, enlighten us as to why, uh, with, with regard to crime prevention and burglary, perhaps you might enlighten us as to why we didn't ap apply for the a government grant, uh, anti-burglary grant uh, from the government. Yeah, as um, a police and crime panel member, I know you were involved in, the, I think, the meeting the other week. Uh, just to reiterate, I mean, a lot of, a lot has been made in the media about this one. Um, we looked at the, the criteria um, and the, when, once we got the force to look at the, the figures, there were two areas in the county which met the threshold. One was in Stroud and one was in Cheltenham. At this time, we spoke to the constabulary and said, what do you what would you recommend in terms of crime prevention? What kind of activities should we be doing if we put a bid in? Their, their proposal would have meant officers going into people's homes. At this point, just before the bid went in, or before we finished the bid, um, we had a 26% abstraction rate of officers. This was at the height of COVID and we were going into lockdown. So a decision was made at that time. We did not feel the constabulary and the constabulary advice was to us. They would not be able to spend the money in, a, in the time period. So therefore we didn't bid for it. In hindsight, it's a wonderful thing. Should we have gone for it? I think if you look at the people who've got the money, uh, I don't think it's necessarily, necessarily a good use of public money, the way people are spending it, if I'm honest. I think this short termism for a headline grabbing safer streets was probably a bit of a gimmick, quite frankly. And um, I think it's sad it was done this way, um, but that, there we are. I mean, ultimately, I think a lot's been made of this one. Uh, no one talks about the fact we've had £167,000 for domestic abuse and sexual violence grant from government at the same time. So I think a bit of uh, politicking got involved with this one, if I'm honest, Brian. But, um, you know, we made a decision. We went for a process and uh, there we are. Oh, just to just to come back, uh, the money was there to be uh, to be applied for, and it was just a, a, a an opportunity. Um, whether we uh, had the opportunity to spend it or not uh, is um, pure conjecture, but to, but it was there to be applied for. But we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Brian. I'm, I'm pleased about that because we did uh, exhaust it at the, at the police growing panel meeting, didn't we? So we had quite a long discussion on that. Yes. Okay. Anything else before uh, Chris moves on to COVID? Okay, Chris, you want to move on to the next part? Yeah, thank you. Sorry, oh. there's two hands up. Can't oh, sorry, Jenna. You've got Jonathan Edmonds and Steve Robinson. Okay, Jonathan, then Steve. Hi, Chris. Yeah, um, just on, yeah, you mentioned um, obviously drugs and alcohol, obviously, yeah, big issues um, with antisocial behaviour on that and other, obviously, other issues. Have, have we, um, are we still, have, have we had any problems with um, sort of gangs, you know, coming from uh, the city areas? I know there was a couple of, I think there was a couple of instances of that, but um, yeah, I just wanted to know if that was a problem still or, or potentially still a problem. In terms of things like dangerous drug networks, is that what you're thinking, county lines? <clears throat> yeah, Sorry, I mean, I've forgotten the word for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah. No, absolutely. County lines is, is still an issue. There's some uh, an article recently, I think, uh, in the media about actually during lockdown, uh, some of the uh, drug runners were actually posing, not in Gloucestershire Mayor, but were posing as key workers. It, it's still an issue that affects uh, mo most areas these days. Gloucestershire is a bit of a, a halfway point stop off for people. Um, when you look how we compare to others, we're, we're not as badly affected. I think, I think a few years ago, probably... 18 months ago, we probably had 18 gangs operating in the county. That has been uh, reduced. Um, that I know you, you, the look on your face there, Jonathan, he's like, how many? That's actually quite small, you know, compared to, yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're not as heavily hit as some areas. That's not to say it's not a problem. And a lot of work goes on behind the scenes to kind of disrupt these organizations. We, we know for a fact the biggest drugs uh, place where drugs come from into Gloucestershire is Lewisham in London and a lot of, a lot of work does go on to try and you know disrupt it but this is a national problem and you know it does take the kind of the, the regional crime squads as they were uh, a lot of work but also local work as well so it is still a bit of an issue um, for all of us actually. Was that your final question? Thank that you. was another one was that it? Thank you Jonathan. No no that's fine thank you I'll let uh, Steve come in yeah thank you. Thanks, Jonathan Steve. Thank you thank you chair thank you Chris uh, pleased to hear that regarding the community trigger and the, you know, the, the very few that have used it um, and that, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at 
to promote it more and to make it more available so so that people know it's there as a as mm. a, as, a, as another use um you mentioned as well about the fire service um do i take it then that you're hoping that they will some of these fire officers that go out and do their community you know particularly in elderly pe people's homes um will be trained in crime prevention so they'll be able to give advice on you know locks and window locks and all the usual things that used to happen when you know when those officers were available yeah steve you hit the nail on the head that's what that's what i'd love to see i think there's a real uh, capacity for the fire service to play a real a bigger role a greater role with regards to community safety and you know the fire service are represented on safe for gloucestershire and when we did the burglary update uh, that came to safe for gloucestershire the fire service offered to liaise with the police and, and do some more work. So I think as chair, I need to I need to follow that up with the fire service and the police to say, what are you doing? Because I do really think there is a real great opportunity when they're doing those safe and well checks to also do some crime prevention and community safety advice, because why wouldn't you? Um, I, think, I think personally, the problem has been um, over the last decade with austerity is that especially with the police, they've been very much focused on the job in hand. And we, the police are very good at taking control and doing their job, but actually we do need to get back to doing more partnership problem solving activity because that's where you'll get the, the kind of the greatest reward i think rather than just sole organizations trying to fix the problems thank you chris thank you thank you steve i don't see anybody else indicating so do you want to carry on chris yeah, and I apologies, Chris, because you've heard a bit of this at the, the, the police and, and crime fine. panel and, and Steve and Brian. So, yeah. <laughs> but um, I'll do it again. Um, in light of obviously COVID, in light of Black Lives Matter and, and the Black, Black, Black Lives Matters and the, the shocking death of George Floyd, and in light of the fact that the, the PCC election was postponed until um, next May, uh, we felt it only right and proper that we review the police and crime plan to be more uh, current in terms of reflecting what's happening in society so we've reviewed that and at the heart of it is that issue of inequality is is the issue that ultimately uh, what is the hallmarks of a of a county force that is its core core job you know crime prevention tackling antisocial behavior burglary those key crimes bearing in mind we we know that's what a, a, a good force should be about but over the last decade they've been dragged in as many of you will have seen with the reported missing program to deal with missing people, vulnerability, mental health. And this is about kind of trying to say, this is what we would like, bearing in mind the context and, and the resources. So Martin has made the every crime matters mantra, um, a big thing about the, the next place in crime plan. And that is, you know, no matter what kind of crime it is, well, no matter when you call the police, you should expect a reasonable service and what that reasonable service looks like. The, the constabulary need to really be held to account for that. And, you know, the finer details of that, we're still working through with them. But for us, that really, really matters. So every contact counts as well, you know, and alongside that, every victim, uh, the victim of crime, what should you reasonably expect from, from your force? So a lot of effort and time will, is going into that priority. And, um, just before probably early days of lockdown, um, Martin made the chief constable uh, a million pounds from reserves available to spend on public contact. And um, we were, it was before lockdown and we were uh, planning, planning, plowing ahead really with a bit of an awareness campaign. Cause one of the things I think the NHS have been very good at is signposting people and triaging them to the right place. I think many of you will know that, you know, the 101 line across the country is not fit for purpose quite frankly it doesn't it's not working as well as it should do and that's not just in gloucestershire that's across the country i think if you find i had a look recently the nine nine the 101 waiting times for i think it was um I'm trying to think which force it was hertfordshire police 101 waiting time for hertfordshire police was four hours um and, and that four hours exactly you know so it doesn't work so what we're trying to do is is in a public awareness campaign as part of the every crime matters is to say to the public if it's an emergency if there's a crime in action if there's a threat to life 999 without a shadow of a doubt if it's non-emergency wherever possible the best way to report the crime or report intelligence and actually sometimes it is in the intelligence that people have been put off in reporting because they're, they're so long on a phone line is to go through the constabulary's website a lot of work has been done done nationally to make forces websites all look similar so you can report crime and it go you you fill in your name and your details and it, it gets triaged better 
Um, you can say, why has this not happened till now? That's, you know, it's like an oil tanker sometimes, I think. Uh, but what we'd like to see in the coming months is a concerted effort by the constabulary to educate the public a little bit more about how they contact the police and what they can expect from the police. So that's the kind of every crime matters. There's a lot more detail in this, and I'm, I'm acutely aware of time. So I could, once we were actually officially um, launching it next week, and I think uh, a member of Strategy Council has been invited to the launch, but we'll send you and the CSP the proper plan so you can trawl through it at your leisure. And I'm sure you might have further questions for me if I, if I come back, when I come back, of course. Any questions, Chris? Sorry. Uh, we've got one, Brian. <clears throat> Unmute yourself, Brian, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, very, very quickly, uh, it was at the PCC meeting it was recognised that the 101 uh, system was a, a bit um, archaic and um, <clears throat> and it wasn't working and um, there were reasons why in that uh, the police were taking calls that they shouldn't be taking and mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and frankly um, uh, it does need looking at. I, I did suggest at that meeting uh, that the uh, incoming calls should be vetted and, uh, and somebody decide whether it's a police matter or not. And um, uh, I'm hoping that um, uh, there will be some kind of inquiry or um, or uh, a change in the system that will sort out uh, the the chaff from the wheat. The wheat yeah. being caused uh, for the police, and the and the chaff is uh, what uh, should be addressed to other other um, uh, departments. So mm -hmm. anyway, I, I, I support what um, Chris has been saying. Is that uh, something needs to be done, and it needs to be done. Uh, quite quickly, and um, uh, and I think the way forward is to vet the cause to find out whether they're police matters or not. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody, you know, I, absolutely accurate. I think when 101 was thought of initially, it was going to be a non-emergency line for a lot of agencies. The pilot wasn't successful, though, so it just became about the police. And actually, the other night, there was the, the, the storms came to Gloucestershire. We had some rain. Trees fell down. Those, the 101 hotline was absolutely inundated. Now, should the police be going out and pulling up trees? Well, we had a firearms officer, heavily trained ARV officer, armed response unit, having to go to kind of clear a tree. Now, there was no threat to life, but the police were there dealing with that. And that's where you get that excess volume. Where, so they can't be dealing, they're not dealing with some of the crimes that are probably more important. And that is a real issue now. As part of this, every crime matters and the money we've made available. The, the police are in the process not to kind of blow the, the, the press release that will come out in the next few weeks, but a piece of software will help. We'll get that. But nationally, there, there is a real problem with police ICT. You know, it's, there's too many systems. You know, if there's one thing I could wish from a government would be to say, here, police force, there's your IT system. Because too many police forces have different systems. In our control room, we have, I think, around about 15 different systems in place. It is ridiculous. But when austerity comes, when austerity came, you're not going to spend money on an IT system that costs 8 million, are you? You're going to spend money on frontline officers. And that's what people wanted. But the problem is, we all know across the police force in this country, we've got creaking ICT. And that's one of the challenges, uh, you know, being brutally honest going forward, which is why I'm hopeful that actually some of the work we're doing now can try and triage better the, the limited resources we do have to deal with, with crimes. I'll canter through the other ones. Young people becoming adults always been a priority of Martin since he's been elected in 2013. That will remain. Children's First is, a, is a, an initiative we brought in a few years ago. That's diverting a lot of young people away from the criminal justice system. You may have seen recently, Martin did a bit of a rant on Facebook. I don't know if any of you saw that about the courts. You know, we have a backlog in our only surviving court in Gloucestershire, the Magistrates Court, of a thousand cases. They're already penciling cases now to 2022. Uh, the backlog is huge, and that's just in the magistrates, and the knock on effect goes to the crime court. Now, you think there's a thousand witnesses and victims there at least who are not getting justice, and that is a real, real problem. So, for us, you know, yes, we still want to go. You know, there are some people who always have to go down the criminal justice route, but for others, can we go through a better system? And that could be a restorative approach, which has been really successful in somewhere like Surrey. And we, we started it two years ago. And I think in its first year, 240 young people in our county went through that system rather than going through the criminal justice system. And out of that, we had a 13% reoffending rate as opposed to, I think it was a 45% reoffending rate before it. So 
I think that that was a that's, a, that's been a success in our in the young people becoming adults portfolio. But it's not just about us; it's about the county council. It's about partners as well. So I can't take full credit for that, even though sometimes it's nice to take credit for things. Um, <laughs> uh, young people becoming adults. So that will maintain, you know, especially in light of COVID. Like one of the things I said to you that you know this has been written in light of where we, what we're going through, the mental health of some of our young people. Um, we really need to be mindful of that. And that's what we, we've got a new lead for young people becoming adults, a lady called Jane Dyer. Uh, I think she'll help really lead this she, uh, priority. She used to be work for Gloucestershire Young Carers, now works for Bridge Training, which is a, a charity that deals with kids who are excluded from schools. She's really passionate about the voice of the young people. So her involvement in this priority will really help drive that agenda. Older but not overlooked. Um, is a priority that will continue. Uh, Phil Sullivan, as many of you will have known, formerly of your parish, uh, the legend that is Phil, uh, will carry on doing this priority. This is about vulnerable groups, again, following on from some of the good work we've done previously, that will maintain. Um, safe and social driving becomes safe and social roads because I think it reflects the fact it's not just about driving, is it's about pedestrians, cyclists, walkers. Um, and we've got a really exciting new lead for that. It used to work for Saab. Um, and uh, the in, in international car industry. And he, he is a, he's a pocket rocket, if I can describe him as that. Um, he set up the Gloucestershire Older Drivers Forum, uh, and he's got a really interesting backstory in that his mother um, was killed by his uh, stepfather because he should have stopped driving, and he, he crashed the car and killed his mum. And his personal story has led uh, Nigel to really push this agenda. So, again, I'm hopeful about the safe and social roads. Um, and then, so that, and then there's Safer Days and Nights, and that priority under Rich Burge, as I mentioned, under Safer Gloucestershire, we'll be looking at antisocial behaviour. One of the successes we've also had is in places like Gloucester, where we've had city protection officers. I mean, these are like your, you know, your wardens. I mean, I, I live in Stroud District. I'm so proud that as a district, we've still got, you know, neighbourhood wardens. They do an amazing job. Gloucester, you have city protection officers. You know, the neighborhood warden model or the city protection officer model could be rolled out across the Cotswolds and it could be really amazing. So Rich is doing a lot of good work on my safer days and nights um, kind of portfolio and that portfolio, and that will feed into Safer Gloucestershire so we get partnership buy-in. I'm running out of breath and I'm probably boring, maybe boring you, but the final thing I just want to say is in terms of uh, Black Lives Matter, um, Martin and uh, actually, we all saw the events in, in America and the policing in, in America is very, very different, firstly, from policing in the UK. Um, but it did have an impact. And Martin, as a, a former officer, it really impacted him. And we, we, he spoke to the chief and we've set up a, a community legitimacy panel, um, which consists of members of the county's black, Asian and minority communities. That will just sense check where we're going as an organisation and also help inform where we go in the future in terms of uh you know how we are as organizations um just a bit of good news i suppose is we're on target for our uplift for officers still you know we're going to get over the next few years 152 officers from central government on top of the 77 that local taxpayers you funded um and we're on track in terms of our ethnic diversity at the moment uh, in terms of recruitment so that that's a good thing uh for gloucestershire and the final thing i suppose in terms of everything in uh, covid um uh, you know we're all, what is the rule at the moment? Rule of six, what does that mean? How do you know? It's very confusing, I think, for many of us. Um, the police, I think, in this county did us proud in the early, in the early part of the lockdown and, and the rest of it. You know, they engagement before enforcement. You know, they did a very practical way. I think you'll see across the country a bit more enforcement going forward because I think there is a real worry where we're going in terms of, you know, escalating um, uh virus rates so i think there'll be a little bit more forceful policing uh, uh, across this county as well as others um the, i'll end with one final thing and I've, it's because I've, I've got someone in the office to do a bit of a pull off for me just to give you some reassurance uh, latest crime rates for stroud district and this is the last 12 months up until the 31st of july 2020 and this is crimes per thousand population now when we compare force by force you compare against eight forces, and Gloucestershire um, is, I can't remember where we are, but we're, we're doing all right in the, in the, in the national slide. We're, I think we're six in the, at the moment uh, in terms of 43 forces. We have gone up because of better crime reporting. But in terms of Stroud District, you get compared to 15 other areas, okay? 15 other areas. Um, the most safest place in your group is Eastern Mid-Devon. 
Then there's South Devon and Dartmoor. Then there's Cheeksbury and then there's Stroud. So out of 15 groups, you're number four on the list. What that equates to is out of a thousand crimes per thousand population, your current crime rate is 47 crimes per thousand population. Your average for similar areas is 51. So we're not doing too badly in Stroud. So take some reassurance, please, uh, councillors, and pass on the message that although things are always not wonderful and there's always more we can do, you do live in a nice, or we live in a nice area because I live in the district too. Absolutely. Well, that's a nice thing to finish on, Chris. OK, we've got a couple of questions. One, Jonathan, and then Jill. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it sounds great, Chris, you know, with the um, about the um, Black Lives Matter and the ethnic panel. Um, where, um, I think I read that uh, stop and search has reduced, because obviously I, I think I read about four years ago that it was quite high for BAME um, people. Um, but I think you've dramatically reduced it in, in recent years. Is that is that right? Is it? I, I think so. I don't have the figures to hand. What I do know is that the recent the new the recent launch, relaunch of the stop and search panel, we've got a lot more members from the BAME community actively involved in it as well. So they're actively involved in scrutinizing it. And I think you're right. I think the numbers have reduced significantly. I think it's still quite high, if I'm honest, because I think you know we have a certain popula a population of black and ethnic minorities in, in a certain area in Gloucester, which sometimes yeah. do, do get, you know, it's quite not targeted, but when they're out there, it's quite, you know, hard to sometimes police it and get it right. But I do think overall, the use of stop and search in the county is a lot better than it used to be. And it, as, it, as it is across the country, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, just just quickly, um, where, where are you moving um, some units down to Barclay, uh, Gordon's neck of the woods? I can't uh, remember. I remember um, Martin saying, I just wondered what was that? I know your driving units were going down there, but I wasn't sure if that so slowed I, down with COVID or... I, no, no, we we have, uh, and I will once it's uh, again officially out there, uh, there is a lovely video. We have uh, a new training facility First time the constabulary has had its own uh, training facility uh, down at Barclay. So uh, it's a cracking site down there and uh, we, we should be really proud of it. And no, I think Martin is doing a tour for some Stroud councillors next week, oh, okay. I believe. Oh, so okay. maybe have a chat with some of your colleagues and find out yeah. who's on it and uh, tag along. All right. Thank you. Cheers, Chris. OK, now Jill. Thank you, Chris. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, can I ask you Black Lives Matters? Um, you said you set up a kind of um, BAME panel. Yeah. I'm sitting on a working group within SDC and they're talking about doing the same thing. Is there any mileage in trying to work together on a more multi-agency across the NHS and trying to work together on some of the issues rather than every organisation working on their own? Yes, is the is the simple answer to that, and I agree. I mean, I think I don't. I know Doina may be on the card. I'm sure I may have mentioned it to Doina. If not, apologies, Doina. If I've, I, but I, I know I've mentioned it to certain councillors because I do think there's. We create panels, don't we? It's very easy. Let's have a panel. Let's have a working group. Let's do this. As a county, we have some amazing activity, but sometimes it's not as joined up as it could be. So I'm all for joining it up. But I don't know if this is just specifically about policing, and it might be a little bit too operationally focused. But you never know. It could be of hand. There's a lady called uh, Sandra Samuel, who uh, we employed actually well before COVID, who is in our what's called the Better Together team. If you're interested um, and if I get your details, I could link you in with her and at least you can scope it out and see if it's remotely possible or to any benefit. I'm sure we'll be up for any sharing of information is always good, isn't it? That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I think that's a brilliant idea, Jill. Yeah, I would pick that up. Brilliant idea. OK. Any, I haven't got anybody else indicating. If that's the case, Chris, I'll let you rest your voice now. Thank you <laughs> once again for your energy and your passion. Because one thing you. I know about you, you're really passionate about, Thanks, about your, your subjects. Yeah. And it comes across in leaps and bounds. So thank you once again for a very thank comprehensive update. Thank you, Chair. Some of the advances this time next year. Fingers crossed. And thank you, everybody. I'll go and uh, make my dinner now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Goodbye. Thank you Take very care. much indeed. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye, Okay. Okay, college, what I intend to do now is bring item 10A forward. So um, Steve Lydon can give us an update on the Gloucestershire Health and Ogre scrutiny to see if you've been poor old Steve here all night. So Steve, are you still with us? I can't see you. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm on. I've got the, can people see the video? I've got it on. Yes, yeah, you are yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, and nice to see Chris again. Um, yeah. 
really, I'd normally come along here to talk about the Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, but obviously with COVID, there's now a new group being set up, which is the, I won't bore you with acronyms, it's the Local Operational Management Engagement Board. Um, but it is quite important. Um, so I thought, and I was going to go to SNR to talk about that. But a lot of the stuff crosses over to the health, as you would guess, what's going on with COVID has a knock on effect of what's happening with the NHS in terms of delivery of services. So I think we all thought there was value in, in blending them together. Um, I'd like to do what Chris has done before, though, is really give you some background and then gladly take me questions. Um, first of all, did people get the paper I wrote? Did that go out? Yes, it did get circulated. Did you get it? Yeah. Yeah. Has everybody got it? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's no point. There's no. There's no point me repeating a lot of the stuff in there. Um, if this, if I can start off with the COVID stuff. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, there are these. Board, there's the local operational management board, which is responsible for looking at the delivery and in terms of uh, local outbreaks primarily. And John Beckett, on behalf of the district council, the head of our environmental health goes along to that. What I sit on behalf of the district is what's called the engagement board, which sits, I suppose, beneath it. And that's responsibility is a bit of scrutiny, i.e. to check what's going being done at the, the main board, but also to advise and guide, particularly on comms and key messages, um, when we have a local outbreak. And that's the primary role of both of these groups. So they're not about managing the whole of COVID and everything that's going on. Their primary role is to look at, as and when we have a local outbreak, what can we do? How do we react? What are the key messages we, we need to get out there? And that's, but it does, of course, touch on some of the other wider issues. Um, I've listed in there who's, who's the membership list. It's chaired by the leader of the county council, um, Councillor Hawthorne, uh, and the public health people do come to, as do the communications people. I mean, Getting on to some of the key issues, um, I get a weekly thing called a dashboard, which actually gives you as much info and data as they possess. Um, the trouble is, and of course, in this day and age, you can understand why, I hope. The vast majority of stuff I get is listed about sensitive and restricted, not to be forwarded, reduced or published. Um, but we did raise that, but I do get, did get permission, and I think all of us raised it, to send, I send that to Doyna as leader and to send it to Kathy, so they get it as well. Uh, in terms of that, gives you what the actual detail is on the local outbreaks, the measurement, uh, where they are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it is a pretty thorough piece of work. There are some gaps in it, um, but I suppose on some of these things, you need to you need to trust that work is being done without us being able to post a whole lot on our website. I mean, the county, I think, in particular, public health have got a lot better at making publicly available stuff, which you all get as members. And I certainly push that out to my local parishes and things like that. And I know that we get weekly updates from Cathy and Co., which is good. Um, going on to what's the situ current situation in Gloucester, which I'm sure that's what you're most interested in. I mean, the Southwest is still, in terms of the, you know, the much known R number, the lowest in England. Um, Gloucestershire has been the highest in the southwest as a county and people say well, why is that? It, it appears it's because we're closest to some of the conurbations, particularly to, to the West Mids, which is just north of us, and of course we're closer to Oxfordshire and also the amount of commute, certainly at the start of it, we have from London. That's the thinking behind it. Um, I'm not here tonight to talk about Cheltenham races, but as you can guess, it's been a, there I say, a number of us have asked for a Stuart's inquiry. There, there's a good term to use about what happened there and why did that go ahead? Um, and there are some key messages and lessons to be learned from that now. Um, the other thing that is, is covered is they're called media uh, super output areas. I won't bore you, but basically there are 70 of those in the whole of Gloucestershire. So they're bigger than district wards, um, but they're smaller than the county divisions. So there is data available for each of those that actually tells you the amount of how many people have got COVID in those areas, how people have been tested. So that is another way of, dare I say, drilling down and, and monitoring what's going on. 
Um, not breaking any confidence, but we've had three. This I just you know, today I looked again at the stuff. Three small outbreaks uh, now in the county. Um, my conscious are on YouTube. Um, they are small though, but obviously because, and I can tell you, they were in the high risk establishments, you know, either a care home or an educational establishment. But obviously that means there might be two or three, but it means they need to be kept an eye on and need, people need to be advised and guided about social isolation and things like that. Um, the other high risk areas, which I'm, no doubt you know this, but are the care homes, uh, they need to be kept very close eye on and places where the public go, um, i.e., as you can guess, I mean, the sports stuff has now all been knocked on the head again. Um, I did put supermarkets down it, but of course those are places where a lot of people go and with people intermix. Um, the other point I would make uh, before I take some questions and move on to the NHS stuff is what does complicate matters, of course, is that it was relative when at the peak of, in March, April, May, a lot of people weren't going to their doctor or using the NHS. You know, A and E. Anybody who went there was pretty, was almost dead which was bliss in some ways. But of course, what's happened since is that demand has now got back to what it was. And of course, no disrespect to people, of course they want to be treated, but there isn't a capacity or capability to do that. So if, I'll just pause at this bit, but it's important to recognize that for the next six months, NHS Gloucester is planning to work on an 80% capacity, i.e. if it's 100% capacity before COVID, um, and we know there are issues then on cancer, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, but to be fair to them, they're saying they are planning to have 80% capacity to cope. And I did ask the question, what happens if you're the 81st person? Um, it would be a clinical decision, um, which sounds a bit brutal. But, but I'll pause because I, I want to give you a chance to ask about the COVID stuff and things like that. And uh, then we can talk more about the NHS things. Is that OK, Chris? Yeah, Check. that's fine, Steve. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Colleagues, anyone want to ask Steve any questions? Jill. You're muted, Jill. Oh, good. Well done. <laughs> um, thank you. Steve, in terms of health inequalities and the Bain community, what oh. kind of work's happening there? Oh, that's a cracker. I've, um, I've asked. No, no, it's a very fair point. I've asked that the next uh, health scrutiny committee, we have a special item on the whole issue of health inequalities um, because COVID has actually compounded what has been an old problem. I mean, I go back to the days of the Black Record in the 80s um, and, it's, and it's critical, yeah. And uh, the, certainly the NHS people and public health no, do understand that there are particular communities which do need to be drilled down into. Um, and it's important that, in fact, that is respected. But on the whole inequalities agenda, yeah, there is more to be done. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I, I can rattle on, you know, people will know poor housing and low income, et cetera, et cetera. One of the knock-on effects is you're more susceptible to infections, et cetera. And, of course, COVID is now one of those. Um, so there's a big role for us all to play. But certainly the point has been made and it is recognised that work is being done and, and more needs to be done. Um, does that help? Somewhat. <laughs> well, I prefer to tell you the truth. I can give you that sort of, oh, yeah, it's all been sorted and it's all done and uh, it's not easy. Who's actually leading on it, Steve? Well, on this work, it'll be public health. Right. It'll be public health and uh, they will be the people leading on it. And certainly in terms of the marketing materials, certainly some of us have mentioned, you need to remember that we've got a diverse, and I think to be fair, they do, but um, we, we have got a diverse community and you need to ensure that stuff recognises that. And also I ask for some more graphical information rather than just written stuff. Yeah, you know, quite often it's better, it's more easy and simple for people to understand the graphical things. Um, and also to talk about working with you know established communities to get the message out there to the various groups, etc. You don't you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You, no. you can actually get people. You can actually talk to them and set up this sort of thing. Okay, thanks, Steve. Okay, anybody else? Any more questions for Steve? We've got nobody indicating. Right. 
Okay, Steve, is there anything else you want to add? Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, there is all the stuff about the NHS, the knock-on effect. But I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll sorry, Steve. Yeah. I'll try and be brief. As I mentioned, I mean, COVID has certainly um, not helped. There are issues which some of us have mentioned about and raised. People getting direct face-to-face -face access with their GPs is something many of us have raised. Um, to be fair, the primary health people have said, give us examples then. <laughs> You know, as, as you do. So if people have got examples, would they not be able to get to actually sit in front of them to meet them face to face? To be fair, for a lot of people, they are. it seems to be working using the phones and Zoom. But I do use example that people like me, mom, God bless her, if she was still alive, if you rang her up and said, how are you? Even though she's got multiple problems, she said, I'm all very well, thank you very much, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we've got to we've got to recognise that, and um, and it's important that that's taken into account. Um, the other big issue I think on all this is I mentioned the eighty percent capacity. The one 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 one. It's likely. Well, it's certainly advisory at the moment, and there is discussion that I don't know if they'll make it compulsory, but. Before people go to A and E, there is talk about you will have to ring one 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 first before you go, because the A and E waiting times of you know capacity have shot up again. And you know, we're talking over the four hours, and uh, so they are talking about doing some sort of triage on one 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 before you go, rather than you end up sitting there. But it's a hard one because you don't want to stop people who are really all going there. But of course, the stuff is it's got to be life and limb. It isn't the place to go if you've got a a cold. Sorry, I'm, I'm not being blunt, but that, that's the key message. Um, the other thing I need to mention is that um, we're in the midst as well, of course, of winter planning, although the joke is, of course, it's winter all year with the amount of numbers we've got. So that's going on. And there's a thing called Fit for the Future, which is also going on, which is looking at making substantial changes. And there's been big issues about partially closing down Cheltenham A&E, which I'm sure you all picked up in the press. Um, the key thing for us, though, is that the hours at the minor injuries units are going back up a bit. Certainly the doors in Durs and the Vale will now open again. I think it's from 8 till 8, which certainly I've been pushing for. And Stroud will go 8 till 8 as well, which isn't perfect, um, but it's better than it was. Um, the other thing, i finished on this, though, and I did mention, yeah, thank you, Jill, for raising health inequalities. You know, that needs to be certainly addressed. The key thing I did, the message I did want to leave you, I and mean, I know it's controversial to some extent in, well, certainly in Stroud Town, was the whole issue of immunisation and vaccination. Um, certainly, there has been some discussion that the vaccine may be here soon. I can't tell you when. But there are already fears that, um, dare I say, anti-vaxxing campaigners are certainly lobbying very strongly against it. Um, bearing in mind that in parts of Strad, we have had issues and problems with low immunisation rates with MNR, for example. Um, I'd certainly like the council to play its full part to actually pushing as much as we can. You know, take if you've offered a flu jab, take it. As and when the COVID virus uh, vaccination comes, so take it. And if you've got kids, they should be immunised. Um, you know, I'm not lecturing you, but for example, in other parts of Europe, well, my grandkids live in, some of you know, in Berlin. Well, to go to nursery there, you can't go in Berlin now unless you've got the immunisation certificates. They won't let you in. Now, I'm not advocating that. However, you all know the rates. If the rates aren't high, you don't get the immunisation because there are certain sections of our population, like people pregnant, we mean, like some of the elderly, like people who've got long-term health conditions that can't be vaccinated. So they rely on the rest of us to do it. And then this might seem like, for most, some of you know this, I know you do, but it's, it is controversial, but I, you know, I'm generally fearful. And flu, of course, has many of the same symptoms as COVID. So if people get COVID, if they don't take their flu jab and get flu anyway, then that may complicate and move into COVID. So they you know, so I don't know, that's a plea really, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm glad if people want to debate on it, let's talk about it. Um, but so I really do think sometimes you've got to put your head above the parapet. So I'll finish on that, Chair. I'm sorry I've gone on a bit. No, that's fine, Steve. That's fine. No, you're absolutely right. Okay, anyone got any questions for Steve on the second part of his presentation?
on the NHS. Nobody's indicating to me. So I'm assuming everyone's okay. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Steve. And no, all the information no. you shared with us. And it's important that you do come along and share it with us. Of course. Um, Just one thing, Chris, if people have got any questions at all, and don't worry if you think they're not important, please send them to me. The one thing I can get, and I'm sure Steve will say the same on his role, certainly on the adult scrutiny in that, we can get answers. And, that, and that's an important thing. And um, and if you do, if there are issues like people, you're getting people saying, I can't get to see my GP, at least we can raise it and flag it up. And that is, that is an important role. Um, anyway, I'll leave you to that. Yeah, no, that's, that's good advice, Steve. Thanks for that. Thank God you bless. Much. Thank you. Bye for now. Okay, colleagues, we'll now go to um, item number six, which is review of Strategic Council's Statement of Licensing Policy. Uh, Rachel, would you like to... Um, to present this or you're just happy to take questions it's up to you rachel i'll just do a, there you are hi there <laughs> i'll just do a really brief just a couple of just a couple of words if i may chris so pleasure, just yeah. okay just to remind everybody uh that we looked at this earlier in the year um the policy went out for consultation between june and august this year and we did get quite a few comments back, quite a few, particularly from town and parish councils, uh, and they're all shown in the appendix to the report. A working party looked at them and we agreed some amendments and we've got a final draft policy, which is appendix B. Just one very quick point that uh, John Jones picked up, there is a duplication of numbering in appendix B. There was a, a new paragraph put in about proxy sales. So I will get that all, um, amended before the policy is finalised. Um, now the licensing policy by law has to be adopted by full council so this evening we're asking committee to agree a final statement of licensing policy under the licensing act and for committee to then recommend to, to council that it's adopted at their meeting on the 22nd of October. So if anybody's got any questions I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you chair. Thank you Rachel. Any questions, anybody? It's pretty thorough, isn't it? Because as we said, it is, you know, we reviewed it and this is the final draft. So if everybody's happy then, I'll, I'll move to the advice. And the advice I got is that the committee resolves to approve the final draft statement of the License and Policy Act and recommend adoption by full council. Is there somebody happy to uh, propose that? Steve has, thank you. We've got a second there. And I can see Jonathan. Now, colleagues, I always, I'm not a great lover of calling votes. I'm a very keen um, promoter of consensus politics. Now, I'm pretty certain that everybody's in favour. Gordon, you want to ask a question? Sorry, sorry, Chair. We do unfortunately have to do a roll call because of the Constitution, so it has to be a roll call. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Things do change in time, doesn't I it? I know. <laughs> OK, so well, I understand, Gordon. You, uh, I've got Gordon for a question, Gordon. Uh Chris, no, it's not a question. I was just uh, raising my hand in favour of the... Uh, oh, thank you. OK, well, Jenna, well, we'll have to go old-fashioned. Well, we'll have to go new-fashioned, then, won't we? And do a roll call. So, so over to you, Jenna. <laughs> Lovely. So it's four against or abstain. Um, so start with yourself, Councillor Bryan. Yes, four. Four, Councillor Craig. Four. Four, Councillor Dewey. Four. Four, Councillor Edmonds. Four. Four, Councillor Jones. Or with the amendment. As with the amendment, yes, John, you're right. Yeah. Councillor Oxley. Four. Four. Councillor Prenter. Four. Four. Councillor Robinson. Four. Four. And Councillor Tucker. Four. Four. Lovely. That's unanimous, Chair. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. You didn't see, Chair. You missed Brian. Apologies, yeah. Brian Tipper. Councillor Tipper. Four. Four. That is not unanimous. So that does make it unanimous. Excellent. Okay. So we're moving to the next agenda item now, which is agenda item seven and the extension of public space protection orders. Um, Mike, are you with us? Uh, yes, Chris, I'm still here in the room. Um, Wonderful. I can see you now. I can only see six at a time on my screen. I'll try and get more on the screen. So, yeah, uh, do you want to, um, to lead on this one, Mike? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Committee. Um, Regarding this extension of the public space protection order, which applies to Stroud 
Town area and Dursley uh, around street drinking. Uh, the order used to be, it's <clears throat> uh, been in some time. We are required that we have to renew it and we have undertaken the consultation uh, that is required under the uh, requirement. And this is to uh, put an extension of three years on the current um, order. Uh, so we are hoping the committee will note that they agree with that to give the police powers that should people be drinking within the, uh, the areas within the plans on the appendix, uh, they can take action against them. Uh, it's been very useful, especially when we've had things like the Fringe Festival um, and it assists the police in able to reduce antisocial behaviour within those areas. Any questions, Chair? Okay, thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? Looks like one or all colleagues. So is everybody happy? Can somebody move the report? We have a proposal, Ken. Thank you, Ken. A seconder? And Steve Robinson. So that's now proposed and seconded. So if there's no debate, any debates, colleagues? Should we go to the vote then? Okay, Jenna. Okay, so Councillor Brown. Four. Four, Councillor Craig. Four. Four, Councillor Dewey. Four. Four, Councillor Edmonds. Four. Four, Councillor Jones. Four. Four, Councillor Oxley. Four. Four, Councillor Prenter. Four. Four, Councillor Robinson. Four. Four, Councillor Tipper. You're on mute, Councillor Tipper. Four. Thank you. And Councillor Tucker. Four. Four. It's unanimous again, Chair. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay. We'll move on to the uh, the big one of the evening, number eight, which is commissioning of strategy for leisure and wellbeing provision in the Stroud District. So over to you, Keith. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, as you say, a, a, a significant uh, piece in front of us here. Um, and what I want to do, rather than go through it page by page, is just provide a few words on context. Yeah. Talk very briefly about the primary outcomes. Look then at the selection criteria which we intend to um, follow in the appointment of consultants, and then talk about the timescale. So in terms of context, this is coming back to committee following um, approval in January to to set money aside to appoint some consultants to, to look at and review the provision of community leisure across the, across the district, um, with the proviso that the tender, as we appointed consultants to look at that, came back for consideration to this committee, which is what I'm doing now. And the report really is to introduce the tender document. Um, so the tender document is significant because it's going to actually set the parameters for us to appoint our experts to, to, to come and work with us to carry out a, a detailed review of provision across the district for the next 20 years. So getting the getting the tender right, getting the sort of um, the framework right against which we want to appoint is obviously important. And it, it's why you wanted to see that again and have a chance to, to consider it. So um, appendix to the report is the draft tender document. A couple of things to start off with at that point, I would say, is we'll be appointing um, expert consultants to come in to produce a draft strategy, not to produce the strategy, but to produce a draft strategy, which will be very much um, for um, consultation with and development and approval by the council as it sees fit. So we're asking people to produce um, a draft that would come back. I think the second thing to say is that we'd be looking for, yes, a strategy document that gives us a sense of vision for the future for the next 20 years, but is more than that, that is very much an action plan for what we should do with associated costs. It's really important that we have a very clear vision for what we want community leisure to be in the district for the next 20 years. But actually that when we receive that, we're receiving something that has got some guidelines some framework and some um, some action 
and recommendations that allow us to get our teeth into it and to move on it with real um, uh, uh, vigor once we get that information. So I think that's the important thing to say. A strategy is great, but it has to have an, uh, an action plan behind it. And that's clearly identified in the in the tender brief that um, is a, an appendix A. It's looking for four principal outcomes, um, an overarching vision for the future of, of, um, of, of leisure provision across the district. Um, that isn't just about our two facilities. It's not just about um, what we deliver as a district council, which is critically important, we know that. But it's about what happens across our communities and across the district um, and how we as, a, as an authority can, I suppose you would say, use our um, influence, use our facilitating capacity, use our enabling function to make sure that we maximise what is available in terms of leisure and importantly, in terms of well-being. This is not something which tends just towards sport it's about looking at our community's well-being. There's a, I think there will be a very strong emphasis on participation in physical activity, but it needs also to reflect the importance of good mental health, of, of psychological well-being. Um, and what we should be doing as a district council, what our district can be doing and how our voluntary sector and communities can work with us and how we can work with them to get something that really, um, that really works for everybody in the community. I think, and it, it's, it's timely and appropriate given some of the other things that have been spoken about already at this meeting, that we very much look to the future about working in partnership with um, health professionals, with public health professionals um, in, in a preventative context um, for our communities moving forward. And I know if, if there were um, public health professionals around at this meeting, and as they can, we want them to be able to contribute to the, to the work as it goes ahead. They, we all know that working together, working across sectors, working with a sense of vision and investment in the, in the longer term for our communities is, is the way to address, to, to address well-being. And actually, and importantly, and I'll mention it again later, um, help to address some of the inequalities um, that exist by virtue of people's ethnic background or gender or where they live or their income. Um, and it's interesting too that that has already been mentioned um, in, the, in the meeting already tonight. So there's that overarching vision, but it needs to be something which brings everybody in. There's an element of the report which will look at how the, our two principal facilities, which we own, one of which we run, one of which we run through a contract, um, are, are they physically fit for purpose? And are they fit for purpose in terms of what they deliver? Um, the uh, Stratford Park Leisure Centre was conceived in the 60s. It was opened in 1974. What was completely appropriate 40 odd years ago, is it appropriate now? And, and, and by the way, are the electrics, the pumps, the, the, all the, 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 the back stairs, um, electrical and mechanical um, facilities that, that, that hold that place together really, what sort of state are they in? And if, and if, and if, and if they're, not in, they're not either fit for purpose by virtue of the design or by virtue of the sustainability of the physical fabric, what does that mean in terms of the future, in terms of what we do? And that bit of work cannot be disaggregated from the first part that says, what is it we need to offer and look at and achieve over the next 20 years for our communities? There's a third outcome, which is critically important, and you'll see how these things mesh together, which relates to Stratford Park itself as a park. It's a, it's, it, it has a really important role to play for the obviously for those people who live quite close to it but as a, as a district focus as well it's an important piece of, of green space it has within it of course the museum and that needs to be recognized how that works it's got the, the, the leisure center itself it's got other sports facilities but it provides a really important recreational space and a space for well-being and um, informal exercise, exercise and, and socialising and, and probably it's in its conception, however many years ago, you know, these areas of public space were always seen as something which is going to contribute to community well-being. You know, we need to look at that and think about what we need to be doing with that space and the facilities within it. Um, finally, um, we would like the expert consultants to come in and provide some advice and some carefully measured assessment 
about how we run our leisure facilities ourselves. At the moment, we have um, a contract with SLM, Everyone Active, as its, as its trading name, um, and they operate Stratford Park Leisure Centre. At the committee meeting on, in January, this committee agreed to extend that contract until October 2024. But I think, as probably everybody is aware, um, and, we, and, and also we've got the, the pulse which we, which we run ourselves. I think, as everybody is aware, um, there are, there's two examples in, just within the district, but there are, there are a number of ways in which um, local authorities can, can deliver leisure services. Um, and it's not a statutory requirement, by the way, that, that, that it does that. Um, but that might be the model where an external, an external company comes in, might be a model that we do it ourselves, it may be, and there are a number of models that, that it could be an arm's length model or a trust model that has various advantages and disadvantages in terms of um, control and, and um, management of, of um, non-domestic rates. Uh, we want to be able to understand what those op options are, to see them clearly laid out. Um, and it's an important part of this piece of work that we do that. That part as well, I don't think is, is can be seen as discrete. One of the things I said uh, early on is our relationship with, for example, public health um, and what, what and how we operate our facilities needs to reflect what we want those facilities to, to deliver. And one of, the, one of the things we're looking for consultants to explore is how we work, not just in, and it's important, not just in day-to-day -day partnerships or year-to-year -year partnerships, but potentially in key long-term financial partnerships so that we can deliver population change in terms of well-being, and to be able to explore uh, and, and express the fact that actually population change, just in terms of population change for physical activity at a population level reduces the cost and pressure on the NHS in years to come. And we need to be looking over 20 years about finding partnerships that are going to allow our population to benefit from good health, well-being of all sorts. But actually, in order to achieve that, we need to be making a business case to, to our partners to say, come with us and potentially invest in that work. Because it, over that time span, we want to see a health service that's under less pressure. We want to see a health service that is dealing with people who are genuinely in need that are not, and, and reducing non-communicable illness because of lifestyles and we can influence that and we can work and we need to we need to take that responsibility really seriously and set ourselves in a in a good place to do it deal with people who've got long-term conditions and so on so those four outcomes are are really important um, um i suppose what i want to mention as well as we're looking to employ consultants to do this work for us is um, rather than go through page by page, by page is just to draw your attention to um, the criteria with which we want to assess the consultants. Because um, this is like our gateway. This is where we're going to look at the way consultants are expressing themselves. And we want to work out that they've got a good understanding of the issues, they've got the capacity and the track record to do it, and they're going to do a good job. Because this piece of work will require investment we will be paying external consultants um tens of thousands of pounds to do this work we we want to get the right people we want to see it as an investment for 20 years and i just listed there on page 15 of the report under the section six procurement um the criteria on quality that we'll be looking at we i'll just run through them one at a time um i'll just dwell on, on one or two of them a little bit more but it's the provision of the needs for the population over the next 20 years, mention that. The assessment of options for um, the two facilities, I've dealt with that already. The future provision of Stratford Park, as I've mentioned. The assessment of the current contract, which I've mentioned. Um, importantly, a recognition of recent previous research. Last year, a piece of work was carried out in association with the local plan, and um, the open space, and green infrastructure, sport and recreation study. That is a, has a wealth of detailed, well-researched information about need um, around sport and leisure. And we would expect our consultants to be using that and building on it, on building on the findings and the recommendations of that piece of work. Um, 
what wasn't, I don't think, on everyone's radar like it was before when this committee discussed this issue last time was the impact of COVID, both in terms of public health. Once again, um, Councillor Lydon, I thought, mentioned it inappropriately talked about the way that is influencing well-being in our, our communities. But it also has an impact and will have an impact on the business model of our deliverers. And we are um, you know, working currently with with SLM and with uh, at Stratford Park and with the Pulse, understanding the implications of, of COVID on their business model. So we need to reflect that in this work. Um, we need to make sure that the quality of consultation is thorough and our communities and all our communities are properly involved in this piece of work and how the consultants propose to do that will be an important assessment criteria. Um, we want to mention, um, we want an holistic approach what I, we mean by that is that we want to look at opportunities to work across sectors and particularly with, I think, public health partners about how we deliver in the future for those reasons that I've previously mentioned. Um, I think also it's important, and I'll just mention a little bit on this, is that we want to properly understand and reflect issues around equality of access and opportunity as we move forward. Um, now that can express itself in all sorts of ways as I've mentioned, there's a particular reference in the tender document that we want and are expecting consultants to bring a contemporary and proper understanding of access and opportunity, um, recognising, yes, people with protected characteristics that may be disadvantaged in, disadvantaged in, us, in accessing opportunity. Um, and some of the restrictions to, act to, to opportunity are, can, be, can be subliminal, can be deeply... Um, uh, uh, ingrained in, in, in lifestyles and residents or in, in quite subliminal um, uh, opportunities for, for disadvantages to come in. And we need to dig deep with that and make sure that we are with this piece of work being, and being thorough, looking at, at issues that may affect people's participation in sport, recreation, well-being, healthy lifestyles. It's a, it's a key um, element because we're talking about people's lives. We're talking about the, 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 the way that they are able to contribute to their, their own communities. Um, and for it, to be, for it to be skimped over or added on um, as an add-on or to tick a box is completely inappropriate. And we would expect consultants when they're coming back to us to tell us that they're gonna be the people we should employ to do this work, that they have a proper understanding of dealing with equality of access uh, and opportunity. Um, I suppose that's the main points I wanted just to out outline, Chair, to say that um, pending any comments that are um, uh, made tonight about this piece of work, if we if a decision is made to go ahead with this tender document or, or, or and or with any amendments to it, we'd look to begin the, cons the, the appointment process uh, next week. Um, we'd give consultancies about three weeks to prepare their bids and then enter a period of about two weeks where we're going to assess them, including interviews. The work itself, um, starting mid-November, I think to do it properly needs a period of time, probably to the summer. Um, we would anticipate getting feedback during that time. We want to make sure that all members of the council can, can contribute to it, that this committee is kept well appraised of progress um, um, and that it isn't anything which is that goes away and comes back as a as a, um, as a as a finished document, but one which is a very live process where everyone can be involved in it. But I think it would be appropriate for us to aim for this piece of work to be finished and signed off by the summer by July. That did take a bit longer than I than I thought, but um, that's it, Chair. Thank you. In terms of the the report and the draft tender document that's attached. No, oh, thank you, Keith. Well, you needed that time because it's a very important piece of work we're going to do. Well, currently I've got Nigel waiting and Ken. So, Nigel, if you want to uh, ask a question. Yes, please. Well, yeah, I mean, thank you, Keith. This is really welcome uh, that uh, the, this commissioning for, of, a, of, a, of, a, of um, a strategy here. Um, during, in, during, the, during the course of performance monitoring, um, there was a lot of discussion, obviously, about um, Stratford Park, etc. And, and most of that, I didn't. It, it didn't end up in the performance monitoring report on the basis that this that you were going to be bringing this strategy to uh, to the committee. Um, 
one of one of the issues of course at the time is the fact that people in Stroud you know don't have anywhere to swim and I don't know if you're aware that the the outdoor swimming pool it was actually heated before World War II before all the pipes were um, used for war purposes um, but the, the point the, the point I wanted to raise was um okay these outside consultants will they be actually talking to um I, it, it, from my point of view, it would be really helpful if they talk to the Stratford Park Management Committee, uh, the Cowell Trust and the Youth Council, uh, because they don't need to. There's already a lot of kind of awareness of the issues and, 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 and expertise, particularly when it comes to uh, Stratford Park, uh, that they could draw on so, so they don't actually have to kind of reinvent the whole thing. Um, so I would just like to know if the plan is for them to be consulting with these bodies? It certainly is, um, Councillor Prenser. Um, if that needs to be expressed more clearly in the report, it, it, it can in the draft, it can be added in, but we would expect to see that. And obviously the, the Carroll Trust and the Stratford Park Management Committee need to be close to this. It's a key part of the work and, and we would want them to definitely do that and, and would be scoring literally scoring the the tenders against the court. I, I would certainly like the fact that the youth council yeah. um, should also be consulted yes yes absolutely no i'm, I'm with you 100 percent, nigel yeah. ken thank you chair um i'd just like to thank um keith and his team for this excellent um piece of work um and also i might to add at the moment uh, thank you rachel for your team's work as well on the previous two topics. Um, you said, Keith, that the, the consultation costs will be in tens of thousands. Can you give us some idea what the upper limit might be? Yeah, the, 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 up, the, the upper limit that we propose setting in this is 50,000 um, pounds. And the document will say, and the draft does say, and I, I can't give you a reference, the draft does say that we would not be expecting tenders in excess of 50,000 pounds. Um, that is based on some soft market testing um, uh, about what, what a piece of work of this complexity is, is likely to. But we would expect it. And the reason that we've said that, I took advice from um, our colleagues in the procurement team. Um, we would, we're not specifying a, a price because we would expect bids to be below that and for them to be a competitive element. In, and 40% of the... 40% of the summary here is going to be value for money. Thank you, Keith. Uh, yes, I apologise. I've just found it on page 66. Well, thank you. Someone has just um, yeah. alerted me to that as well. So, yeah. um, uh, uh, Despite having read through this twice, uh, once, as you know, but I read through it once this afternoon as well. So I did miss that. £50,000 to look at you know, our future health and sport and everything else. Um, for the next 25 years seems re reasonable value for money for me. Okay, thank you, Ken. Gordon. I've got you, Gordon, Bye. down. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, welcome, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Keith, um, question for you regarding the accuracy of the, uh, the briefing. Uh, you, you did say that it was very important to have that uh, as, as, as accurate as possible. So uh, can I take you to page 64 um, of 79 um, and just draw your attention to the third paragraph in section five, um, uh, where it would appear that Dursley, Dalesworth and Stonehouse are both market towns and small villages. Um, right. and that my, my, in my ward, we have a market town called Barclay, which doesn't appear on the list either as a market town or a small village. So if you could, if you could have a look at that, it would be much appreciated. Uh, yes, certainly my, uh, that, my error and responsibility for that, I will go back and, and look at that um, carefully. Yeah, also, also <laughs> Keith, I've had uh, a ward member for Cain's Cross on to me as well. Oil case cost is omitted from this as well. So we need to look at that as well. Yeah, in the same I, paragraph. Um, that it is important and, and I think uh, it needs to be right. So my apologies for that. 
yeah. So if we get them sorted, thank you for that, Gordon. Jim. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, thank thank you, Keith, for that um, overview. Um, I also would endorse that it's um it's a good it's a good uh, good good start, good overview of what you want to do, and I'm very pleased with the, the work you're doing. Um, I would just like to ask um, this strategy is covering twen twenty years, and you're aware that you know, as a council, we passed the emergency uh, resolution for, uh, you know, the, the climate change and carbon neutral by 2030. Um, I, I just wondered how, how will that be reflected, uh, you know, becoming a carbon neutral leisure centre, if you like. I just wondered how would that be reflected in the review? Would that be something that you would be looking, you know, would there be expertise with consultants, etc., on um, you know being able to get a, a low carbon um, leisure centre, etc., is that something that you've you've of, you probably have considered? But if you could explain that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we we have considered that, and there's a, a reference, I guess, to um, um, recent research in it, but maybe more explicitly referencing the importance of of. Of, of alignment with the carbon neutral commitment of this of this authority would be appropriate when we're looking at um, redesign and current fit for purpose issues such as energy efficiency. Um, so yeah, w I think worthy of, of perhaps bringing more clearly out in this document, Councillor. Okay, okay, yeah, lovely. That that would be great if you could do that. I'd um, I, I'd certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Ken, do you want to come back? Yeah, just a quickie, please, Chair. Uh, Keith, um, there are other villages missing off here, like Kingswood and North Nibley. Kingswood being substantially bigger than some in the list. So perhaps if you want to chat tomorrow, I'm quite happy to um, talk to you about that. The other thing is on, um, on page 64, down below where Jim is talking about, it says there are 10 electoral divisions in South District, in Stroud District. It might be worthwhile putting in there, there are 10 county council electoral divisions, just, just to avoid any confusion. I'm sure Keith will take that on board, Ken. Yeah, so I'm just making a note of that, Ken. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Brilliant, yeah. okay. John, John, welcome, John. John, are you indicating you would like to speak? Sorry, yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> That's all right, I'm doing that all the time, John, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. I'm privileged, I can keep mine open all night long without having to shut it off, so I, don't, I get away with it tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Keith. Just to go back to what uh, Nigel was saying about uh, people being consulted, will ordinary members be part of the consultation as well? Um, I'm thinking in particular of those of us that represent districts, wards that are out in the sticks, if you like, um, because getting to a leisure centre either in Stroud or Dursley from west of the A38 is nigh on impossible unless you use a motor car. So, um, and to go back to carbon neutrality in future years uh, public transport would be uh, well worth exploring so if members could be consulted as well I think that would go a long way towards getting a proper picture okay um, I, I suppose there's, a, there's a, um, a long and a short answer to that and, and first of all I think Every member in the council should have the have access and be and be have the opportunity to contribute to this because I'm sure there's a whole range of issues that we need to make sure we don't miss. Um, I think that you also mentioned the issue of um, of rural communities, and that is why we need to say, you know, how do we work effectively with our community and voluntary sectors? What role and how do we use the leverage and influence that we have as a district council? to support small communities and village halls to, to support their communities, often in 
you know, that could be anything. That can be line dancing in a in a village hall. It can be actually sometimes things that that are to do with community well-being and psychological support. But what is really interesting now uh, is that we've seen the way communities pull together and have done in a response to to COVID. We need to be getting right into that and looking at the way communities can be part of and supported to be part of of, of delivering. It, it it would it would be too expensive, impossible to deliver, and not as good if everything was delivered directly um, by a, a central authority. It, I think much more effective if there's an understanding of local community needs and can also use the power of volunteering as part of that. So we'd want to do that. And you know, the way into that is, the, is, 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 is often through elected members and we wanna make sure that you all have an opportunity to access that this piece of work and we would expect we would be expecting the consultants who come back and say that they're the people we should choose to understand that and be explaining to us how they intend to do it and what proportion of the time they expect they expect to spend if you'll see the scoring mechanism here in terms of the criteria you know and we have um as one of our one of our criteria the quality of consultation with communities partners and service providers we would expect to see the consultants explaining what they're going to do and what effort they're going to, to put into properly consulting with communities. Um, and that includes, of course, um, working at a local level with uh, all elected members. Okay, thank you, thank you. John, happy with that? Yeah, okay, but if I can just make a point, um, there is line dancing in Whitminster Village Hall. <laughs> Of course, once a week now. So uh, don't ask. There we, are. we won't overlook them then. <laughs> okay. I'm glad I'm glad that. That. Jonathan. Yeah, just quick observation, really. Yeah, it's just the importance. I'm I'm from a sports and health sort of background, and I, obviously I'll be yeah be interested, obviously with um, with clubs I represent and things. But yeah, I think Keith raises some really good points about equality of um, access and opportunity. I think it's really important that we contact some of these non-users, the people who don't use our facilities. I know that can be hard to, to to drill down to those people, but you know why why are they not using our facilities? Um, you know some of the people with the protected characteristics. How we can you know engage them more. The people who the who are um, who are less active but want to be you know encouraged to do more exercise. You know it's really important to. To get those sort of people rather than just the usual suspects um so yeah no really really pleased and obviously you know we possibly through covid things have changed you know less people possibly using gyms a lot more people are using green spaces and we've got some magnificent you know some of the best green spaces in the in the country so i think it's really important to see how we use those you know those areas and how we also um protect those, those those green spaces moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. No, that's, that's noted, I'm sure. Nigel. Um, yeah, just uh, in relation to 4.4, the environmental implications, I understand that there are no specific environmental implications arising from the recommendation, but some of the things that they may come up with, particularly in relation to Stroudford Park, will would would ha would have quite big environmental implications including you know particularly regarding biodiversity um etc so i don't know maybe it's just me maybe that 4.4 does take account includes the possibility of that in which case it's it's fine as fine as it is but um just maybe it's just how i'm reading it Keith, I'm sure I'm sure it is, is part of the assessment. It will be, but uh, can you answer that for Nigel for me? Yeah, I, I, um, um, I'll, I'll take advice really in terms of whether we need to change that as the implication of this particular report. That's but, what I was thinking of. Is this is just the the environmental impacts on the report going out to consultation, not the contents of the report. Yeah, but that's absolutely fine then. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's how I would have read it. Nigel. That's what I'm saying. I wasn't. I wasn't sure which which of the two it was referring to. If it was, if it's just referring to that, and that's fine. 
That's how I would read it, Nigel, but I wanted Keith to, to Yeah, to that's how that. I read it as well, but I also read it another way. Yeah, that's I absolutely fine. Clarification on which way I should be reading it. Yeah, but it will certainly be included in the final document, I can guarantee it. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. I just uh, that issue of environmental implications, I'm uh, you know, referring to a previous question from uh, Councillor Dewey. That I think not necessarily 4.4 of the report, but within the tender document, a reference more clearly yeah. to, to environment is is probably worthy of of, of, of re for the avoidance of doubt. Absolutely, no, I would expect that big time in there. Bearing in mind the uh, our program. Okay, Jim. You there, Jim? I am. I am, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, just a, a quick. It was just a thought um, uh, prompted by by everyone's discussion, which I found really interesting today, and as well as Keith's uh, overview. Um, it was just thinking about, our, you know, a little bit outside the box. We've got a cycling and walking strategy in the district, and um, it was when John mentioned about, you know, how we could get people to to uh, attend our leisure centres or. or you know, or village halls or whatever. Um, I, I used to be a member of the Pulse at one point, and um, you know, as part of that, I did actually try and cycle to to the Pulse if it wasn't raining, maybe. <laughs> um, and I have, a, I, you know, I, I got a set. I've got a second-hand electric bike, so that makes it a lot easier, actually. Um, but I just wondered if that was something that you you thought we could maybe link in some way our, our cycling and walking strategy as part of the experience of exercise and you know I, I always like to ride a bike if I've got a purpose you know to go to do it I mean I'm, I'm strange that way is that something Keith that you think might be useful to link in yeah I think I think I think it is important that we I mean yeah it is important that that's that that's referenced the people cycle for all sorts of reasons and there's there's, I think we, we do mention governing bodies in here. One of the governing bodies that's probably made the biggest impact in participation over the last 10 years is British Cycling. Um, you know, more people are cycling now than ever. And um, one of the drivers behind that were, were the initiatives that have been, that have been um, brought forward over the last 10 years through British Cycling, through, through not just through a sort of osmosis, but through a, a specific um, strategies for increasing participation and it's made a big difference people see cycling very different now than they did and we would expect that to be reflected in in the in the study and we would expect our consultants to be picking that up when we select them okay chris can i can just just yeah, come of course can, yeah. yeah i mean i i think um i think the the advent of electric bikes has made a huge difference to to making this more viable uh, and i know councillor leiden's got one and Councillor Pickering and, and and I've got one and I'm sure others have. Um, so yeah, I think it would be something that maybe even five years ago wouldn't be quite so relevant, but now could be something could be an option if we could, you know, link it in with our you know cycle paths and cycleways, um, because we are working on one, for instance, the Cam Dursley Yuli cycleway, which would go past um, pretty much the the Pulse, for instance. So that would be something I, I'd be interested to see if you could. Spare some time on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Steve, Steve Robinson. Yeah. Are you there, Steve? F thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Keith, for your explanation. Um, just on the, first of all, I think we've realised, particularly during COVID, that uh, the, the biggest is not always the best. Um, and, you know, just how, how, how how well the corner shop is done so i think we do need to look after what john said and what lots of people have said uh, and i know that you know if we talk to all our market towns they'd all like us from in paul it's the first thing they say but you know many of them don't realize just how much it costs and how much it costs to run and how many people you need to use it but i do think that we should be looking at all our market towns as you said really Keith at the provision and I'm really keen that 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 happens um on our pre-meet I remember you saying Keith that um um in a past life you saw leisure centers where many other agencies 
were involved in it, be doctor's surgeries or whatever it might be. So I hope that within the um, with within the uh, product that you you know the commissioning that we will be looking at not only you know a leisure centre but lots of other agencies using it uh, and trying and see what the need would be for another doctor's surgery in somewhere that you could tag on something else. So, yeah, I, I hope that will happen as well, Keith, please. I, I, I've got, um, um, it was only, it was last September, 12 months ago, we, we took um, some of the senior um, health professionals from Aberdeen on a, on a, a three-day study trip to the northwest of England, specifically to look at um, cross-sector collaboration on health and well-being um, and if, if nothing else I would like the consultants to be bringing some of those ideas um, forward for consideration in this piece of work. Right okay. Thank you. All right Steve you happy with that? Excellent okay. So Gordon Craig, Gordon do you want to come back? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so, uh, just one thing. Uh, my, I'm just fired to, to think about this. Um, I, clearly, we're talking about uh, the uh, the work that can be done uh, to to add in in a sort of traditional way uh, to to leisure to just check that it's it's uh, it's sufficient for our needs as well. Um, but. Actually, I think we, it was mentioned that we have a lot of green spaces in the, uh, in the district. And uh, I, I just want to check that um, the major green spaces are going to be looked at very closely in terms of how they can be um, upgraded and highlighted um, to, to just uh, have extra use. I'm thinking particularly about the seven way um, which is an, an amazing uh, uh, walk uh, with amazing views uh, going right through our district, in, n not in the Cotswolds, but in the other bit of a district that personally I think is even more beautiful. Um, and of yeah, course, yeah, yes. <laughs> it, it, it runs from the Severn Bridge all the way up to Gloucester, uh, right through our district from top to bottom. Um, it's, a, it's a piece of uh, um, uh, pathway that... Has Amazing history, Romans, Vikings, all that sort of thing. Very, very under focused. And uh, is 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 that something we could look at in terms of, you know, raising the profile of that sort of thing? I suppose what I'd say to that is yes, at one level, yes, of course. Um, I, I think what I do want to do with this piece of work is um, the open spaces is referenced and the, and the previous work on the open spaces assessment is we would definitely want to, to, to do that councillor craig i think it's important just to, for, to remind ourselves that what this is doing is it's working on the appointment of the consultants um and I, I really do want to make sure that we have a live discussion about shaping the once we have appointed the consultants as well um it's not just how they respond to this we will want to make sure that that no, no appropriate stone is left unturned in terms of this piece of work. Um, so that, and that's a good example of, of we, we will want to make sure not just that the selection process, but when the work is in detail being mapped out by the consultants that things like the, um, the seven way and its contribution is, is reflected in, in the work that's done. Excellent, thank you, Becky. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Chair. Just uh, some quick points, uh, probably to add um, to what's been said, uh, but um, multi-use buildings are, I think, are, are a way uh, forward and, and for the future. Classic example is that the modern fire stations, they were uh, built, you know, for multi, to be uh, used in many ways. Um, a classic example is, um, I don't know if they still do, but the Jersey Town Council use um, the fire station to, uh, as a place to meet. Um, the ambulance people joined uh, in, uh, in the building. Um, other ideas that were put forward as well was um, perhaps a BC BCSO could uh, spend some time in the local library um, so that they can be approached uh, you know, while they're there. Um, 
but all I'm trying to say is I, I'd like to, to see um, uh, multi-use build, um, buildings coming into being and um, where a, 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 well, the community can actually get together a lot more than they do. That's, uh, but uh, I, I do like that per particular aspect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Brian. Yeah, okay. I've got no, no one else indicating to speak. Is there anybody else would like to, anybody else would like to contribute? Okay, well, firstly, Keith, thank you for the work you've done on this. It's a, it's a lot of work you've done. Um, I've been on this council best part of 20 plus years, and this is the biggest piece of work I've seen being undertaken under leisure in that period of time. You know, so it's a very important piece of work we're going to do, and we're looking at the future of health and well-being and leisure across our district for the next 20 years plus. So I think the challenge now is to get the right consultant um, to be able to communicate with that consultant to make sure it understands our needs and comes back with a plan which we can all agree. So I'm sure over the period of time, we will have a lot of input into this document at some stage or another, if not updates on regular, I would like to see updates for this committee and council at regular intervals anyway, to make sure it's on track because it's a massive piece of work. And I know Keith's got the experience to help deliver that. So, so thank you for that, Keith. What we'll now do, if, if members are happy, is to um, tell you what we've got to what we've got to vote on tonight, colleagues. The committee wants to resolve to approve the tender brief to commission industry experts to carry out a review, making recommendations and produce a draft strategy for leisure in the Stroud District, and B to delegate authority to the strategic director of communities in consultation with the Chair of Community Services and Licensing Committee to oversee the commissioning of suitably qualified expertise to undertake the works and report back to this committee on progress and bring the final draft strategy to this committee. And I think that's covering all bases there, colleagues. So can I have somebody would propose that for me, please? Steve, you're proposing it, thank you for that. Is there a second there? Second there, brilliant, in the room. Nigel? Okay. Colleagues, I think we've had a good discussion on this. So what I'm now going to do is ask Jenna now to take it to the vote. Jenna? Councillor Bryan. Four. Four. Councillor Bryan. Four. Four. Councillor Dewey. Four. Four. Councillor Edmonds. Four. Four. Councillor Jones. Four. Four. Councillor Oxley. Four. Four. Councillor Prenter. Four. Four, Councillor Robinson. Four. Four, Councillor Tipper. Councillor Tipper. Four, sorry, Chair. That's all right, thanks, Councillor Tipper. Councillor Tucker. Four. Four, so that's unanimous, Chair. Four. Excellent. Okay, thank you for that, colleagues. Okay, we'll move on to item nine now, appointment to outside bodies. Have you all got the report before you? of all the nominees we have for committees or outside bodies. We are one short, we would desperately like somebody to sit on Citizens Advice Bureau. Is there anybody in committee that would like to take that position? It's one of the bigger ones we've got because we give them quite a lot of money. So it'd be quite useful to have a representative on there. If I can't twist anybody's hands and I've got... <laughs> Jenna just sent me no hands, so that means no hands are gone up. What I'll do with your permission is I'll ask the group leaders to ask if they have anybody outside of our committee if they would like to take that position. If not, there is a fallback position. Steve, do you want to contribute? Let me just say, Chair, if there, nobody does really want to do it, um, I will give it a go. And Wonderful. See. Okay. Excellent, Steve. I That's know, very, very I kind of you. Sorry, I don't know what the commitment is, how, how, how often the meetings are. I know Gordon was doing it and he, he's now a trustee, but um, yeah, I'll give it a go. Thank you, Steve. That's very kind of you. All right. Is all members happy for Steve to be our representative? Excellent. OK. Um, the other one was the Stroud Fringe Festival, which haven't met at all in two years. So I think we're going to do a review of all our outside bodies and our charities. So my recommendation is we leave it until that point in time to see what we're going to do in the future. Is everybody happy with that? Mm -hmm. I'm getting some nods around the room. Okay. 
I'm mindful of the time, guys. Shall we move on to item 10, which is now uh, Jim? Sorry, Jim? Oh, yes. Do you yeah, want to sorry, say anything on outside sorry. bodies? Yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. I'm, I've just spotted that um, for the account for the health and wellbeing partnership. Yeah. Um, the substitute is Councillor Norman Kay. Right. Uh, who I think was on this committee. I mean, I'm happy to be to to to, to take on that substitute role. Okay. If that was appropriate, because uh, um, I think Norman and I swapped on the environment anyway. So. Right. Is that that's okay? Something you know, is there like something you want to talk to? to um, could you could you possibly just ask Norman if he if he's happy with that, Jim? Yeah, we'll, because we'll yeah, that would be lovely if you could. If Norman's yeah. still happy to do it, fine. But if not, you take on that position. I'd be grateful. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Okay. Members' reports. Um, we've had A, so B. Then that's museum in the park. Nigel, do you want to um, talk to your your document? You, you, you presented a very well presented document, I may add. Um, it, well, only if people have questions they wish to ask about it. Okay. Any questions for Nigel on museum in the park? No questions. Thank you very much for that, Nigel. Welcome. Um, police crime, police and crime panel. I was your representative because of my position as chair, but unfortunately I couldn't get onto the meeting to about an hour and a half into it due to technical issues. But very kindly, Steve Robinson was there and Steve is quite happy to give us a very quick update. If you would, Steve, I'd be grateful. Yeah. Okay, chair. Yeah, I was there on, with my county council hat on. Um, yeah, happy to do that. Uh, much of it has been said by Chris already, yeah. but um, I mean, when he said, about the problems regarding suspects waiting for court hearings that is a concern you may have seen in the press that uh, Martin Searle offered the uh, Sarancester Magistrates Court because as members may know uh, the police um, the PCC bought the court in Sarancester and in Strode so they own, own the whole sites um, and uh, that has been taken up, I see, in the press, so that Sarancester Court is opening back up from Mothball, and um, so that should move th through quicker. Um, the uh, remodelling, Chris didn't say about remodelling police operations. Um, there is a, a new superintendent has been appointed for two districts, with ourselves being Cotswold and Stroud. Um, and then we'll still be an inspector for each area. Uh, many of you know that there are neighbourhood policing and there's fast response or whatever. Fast response officers now are also doing follow-up work, um, following up incidents. Um, and I did ask at the last meeting of the Police and Crime Panel whether that would mean that there wouldn't be such a quick response because if response officers are in somebody's house, but I was assured that it wouldn't. So that will be to see uh, whether that happens or not. Um, I'm just looking down my, because I don't want to really reiterate what was said. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's been mentioned previously at these meetings, the amount of time that police officers are having to spend um, on mental health issues. Um, that is still a real problem, that the amount of non-crime demand that the police are having to deal with is tremendous and it outweighs really what, the, what they're actually set up to do. Um, I think it has been mentioned previously as well that there is a, um, a mental health car that works on certain times of the week and evenings, um, which are deemed to be the most um, productive times. And that, that goes out with a police officer and a mental health nurse. Um, so that will be continuing. Um, but there, there is the problem with so many of the uh, professionals uh, finish work at five, half past five in the mental health teams 
um, and they're not accessible as well at the weekends. We do know that there is the um, that there is the crisis team that are available, but there's only so many of them. So the police are really being called on, as we know so often with mental health issues. Um, and there's there is the ongoing issues of um, suicide and self harming. Um, Chris mentioned earlier, you know, with the younger age group um, from sort of 14 up to 25 year olds, which is quite serious in the, in the district as a whole in the Stray district. Um, there has been baits of that. Uh, safer streets, Chris mentioned about, and the chief constable, yeah, he did mention that, the chief constables had his contract um, extended uh, from December 22 to December 25. Um, I think there's a general agreement that uh, the current chief constable is doing a good job. And um, so he was offered an extension to his contract, as I say, to December 25. Um, officer training, well, that is restarted because there was a bit of a, and it, yes, it was meant, it's down at the new training centre at Barclay. And just to say, um, Councillor Tipper mentioned about the, uh, the grant that wasn't applied for um, and um, it did get, I felt myself at the meeting, it did get a little bit political but you know there were there were similar councils, Devon and Cornwall that applied for it, um, Cambridgeshire applied for it but then Warwickshire um, and um, Wiltshire like ourselves didn't apply for it so you know it's give and take a little bit on that one okay chris thank you steve that, 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 that was very good you picked up some very good things there thank you very much indeed all right would anybody have any questions to steve on that i think um you know chris did cover a lot of it off earlier on yeah and, and then steve just confirmed everything which is good so thank you very much indeed i appreciate you supporting me on that one steve Okay, okay yeah. next one there is Gordon. I'm, I've got you down for two, Gordon. I've got you down for the um, for the for the LEP business group and also for citizens' advice. You have indeed, Chris. Uh, so the, the, let me start with the LEP because that comes first on my list. Yeah, um, <laughs> they, uh, that, and, and it's the quickest as well because there hasn't been a meeting uh, since our uh, our last meeting, so I have nothing to report on that. Okay. Apart from to say that uh, Brendan Clear uh, is now uh, a part of that group. Um, oh, right, and, okay. Yeah. And so, and so Brendan will be able to give a perspective on it as well. Um, I, my part of the group is shrinking back a little bit. I, I have to say, I have, I have found what I expected to be uh, a, a, an organisation that would set strategic plans and... Um, and, and uh, get grant funding uh, for uh, tourism businesses in in the in in the district and in fact in the county. Um, I, I found that they that's not what they're doing. It, it's very much a talking shop. So I I'm taking a, a a step back from it to some extent. So I may not be at all the meetings, um, but I think Brendan will be. And so together, I think we can probably um, we can probably report on that going forward. Right. Okay. And, and I hope I, I hope I have better news to tell you than than, than, than what I've just said. Okay. <laughs> thank you for that one. Okay. Um, so so move, moving on to uh, citizens' advice. Um, you, you're right. Uh, I went along to citizens' advice, and uh, and after a little while, I was so impressed by what they were doing uh, that I uh, I uh, agreed to become. A trustee, uh, which is why we're now looking for a, uh, yeah. another representative, and it's great that Steve's coming along. I think he will get a great insight and be a great, um, you know, a, a, be a great support to the, to the trustees. Um, just so you know, uh, Citizens Advice is uh, is not a national charity. I think people tend to think that it is. It is, in fact, uh, um, a, a nation of local charities. It's probably a better way of putting it. And, and our charity covers uh, the two district councils, uh, um, Stroud District Council and Cotswold District Council, um, and is responsible completely for its, I'm sorry about that. 
it'll stop in a second. I wasn't anticipating that. Um, that that's nine o'clock, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the um, uh, so basically, um, Stroud District Council accounts for about for actually more than two thirds of the total work. Uh, so, so we're by far and away the biggest of the two. And in fact, uh, some of the some of the figures that you may be interested in, on average, uh, nearly four hundred clients are seen per month. Uh, uh, so that's a lot of people getting advice. Um, and uh, the top issues are uh, benefits, uh, followed by employment, followed by housing. And you you may or may not know, and members may or may not be aware that. As a district council, we delegate uh, benefits responsibilities to citizens advice. So um, uh, the, the funding we give them uh, actually covers a portion of the staff costs involved in that. So that's why I think you mentioned that they, they have a lot of funding, but, but they actually do a lot of work for the district council uh, with that funding. Um, the staff is made up of a mixture of full time and uh, people who are experts. Um, and very highly trained volunteers. Uh, so, if any of the uh, if any of the councillors want to to add to that list in terms of volunteering, I'm sure uh, that you would all find that what they do is really quite amazing, uh, as, as I certainly did. Um, so, right now, recruitment is underway for uh, two additional paid advisors, um, and they are uh, they are to support to food banks. And you might think, well, that's a bit strange. I thought citizens advice uh, was something totally different to the food banks. Um, but what happens is when clients, as, as they're called in citizens advice, uh, go along to a food bank, um, there is always an underlying reason or a number of underlying reasons as to why they're at the food bank. And so what these uh, advisors will do is, is when people go along, they will speak to them about their underlying reasons and uh, and try to uh, uh, to help them and to support them in uh, in in overcoming the problem that's actually brought them to the food bank. So it's it's proper caring. It's it, it's it's about it's about a big solution uh, and and not just about supplying food for the short term. So that's what that's what that's about. And as I say, uh, there are. Uh, to um, the recruiting right now for two people to do just that. So moving on from there, um, the, uh, just to update you on what's happening office-wise, um, uh, as a result of COVID, the Stroud office uh, and all the outreach branches around the district are closed and the staff are all working from home. Uh, they're working on Microsoft 365 and Teams, and, uh, and they have a telephone system, which is very good. Basically, anyone who calls them is immediately put through to the next, automatically put through to the next, next available advisor. So there's no, there's no intermediary. They go straight through to, to, to an advisor, uh, which is really good. Um, so they've never been busier than right now. And uh, the, the, uh, there's an amazing dedication from the staff it's really quite humbling to see it. Uh, the, um, and the other great thing about it is that, you know, when you think about it, given the fact that, that they're on the end of a, end of a phone, it means that, uh, that everyone in the whole of a district is only a telephone call away uh, from help at any time. And, and that telephone number is 08088 and that's it. It's as simple as that. So that's the update. I hope that that's helped to understand citizens' advice. And if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you for that update. Any 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 questions for Gordon? No. And I think Gordon, everybody understands. You know, I think everybody knows how important CAB is and the great work they do. And that's why, certainly as a district council, we've supported them. For as long as I've been on this council, and you know, quite substantially. Sure. Uh, for long may that continue, Brian. Do you think we could add that number again, and uh, perhaps uh, Gordon could repeat it a couple of times? Just so we'll to, I'll ask Jenna to send it out to you all, Brian. We'll get it sent out. 
Okay. Yeah, that's important that people that we have that number, then we can pass that number on. Yeah. If, if we, yeah. Absolutely. That's a very good idea. We'll do that. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, I've got um, performance monitoring now, and that's the uh, document you've got in your pack, which is I must confess for the first time reading on this committee a very detailed report. So yeah, congratulations to the authors of that report, Nigel, and Mike, and all the team of people that put that together. Lots of information there. So is there anything you two guys would like to talk about it or are you just happy to take any questions? I think I would, I would definitely like to just commend um, all the officers involved, you know, uh, the museum, uh, the youth services, the Pulse Health and Wellbeing team and the revenues and benefits team for the fantastic work that they did through lockdown. I just actually tried to draw attention to some highlights of all that. I mean, please do, Nigel. Yes, please. The museum was, um, had really good online engagement. They put on all sorts of things for people. Uh, the Pulse work didn't just sort of sit around doing nothing. They upskilled their staff. They put on a huge number of online classes, which were taken up. And they've now, since then, gone back to actually having a, a thousand children back on the swimming program, which is quite amazing. The Youth Council as well was really kind of in tune with the kind of mental health implications of, of uh, lockdown and really kept up contact with vulnerable young people throughout all that. And also has been looking at how it can, uh, how it can carry on working with youth, uh, with uh, the youth council and the youth forum. So th they, they were fantastic too. And the health and wellbeing team were absolutely brilliant. That we're the only um, authority in Gloucestershire working, they carried on through lockdown, putting on specific programs for, you know, populations of people recovering from cancer, cardiac respiratory diseases, etc. And that was absolutely brilliant and worked really closely with lots of other um, agencies and were particularly in tune to the mental health implications of, of lockdown as well. And um, the revenues and benefits team, um, you know, obviously there are lots of changes of circumstances. They found it very challenging and working from home, though, meant at least um, they were in, in one sense undistracted. And the, the, the business support grant uh, has been a, a great success as well. I don't know about other councils, but um, I was contacted and asked to contact three businesses that hadn't responded. So I went out and actually met the business people. And that was very interesting actually talking to them. They then applied and I think that they um, successfully got the grants and stuff. So, and the discretionary um, grant scheme as well. So, so I just think that everybody involved, um, it is, you know, we keep hearing about how there are unprecedented, very difficult times. But I, I really think our officers deserve absolutely commending for all this. And the people of Stroud are very lucky to have such a committed and capable staff. Well said, well said, Nigel. And I, I'm sure Kevin will minute that. I'm sure he will. Mike. Uh, I've got nothing to add, Chris. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy. It's, it's a member's report. I was just hopefully there to support it, Nigel. So you just bash there in the glory, Mike. Take, take the praise, it's well earned, because it is a lot of information there, Nigel, and, mm. and you know, congratulations to you as well, because you've done a good job there, you know, getting all that information together for members to, uh, before I call Matty, any, any members want to ask a question on any of the performance monitoring? So I've got, I've got Matty waiting to, to contribute. Steve okay, Matty, nice. would you like to, to join us? Thank you very much, Chair, very kind of you. Yes, uh, uh, yeah, very good um, productive evening uh, listening to all, all that's going on and I'm, I'm delighted that uh, the good work is continuing and your very able chairmanship uh, chair um, and um, I'd like to congratulate Nigel on this uh, fabulous performance uh, management report it really is so full um, and I did note that it does say um, a youth um, uh, council mem a representative was unable to to attend the monitoring meeting. And that was one of the recommendations that did come out of our task force, that youth members would be invited in future to performance management meetings. Um, and that doesn't just mean for CSNL. And when I mentioned it uh, to, how, to my housing colleagues, nobody had heard anything about it. So could I ask that that is um, action, please, that other committees, we. We, we, we felt, didn't we, on the task and finish group that, that the youth should be on, on all performance management uh, across the committees. So 
Um, I would love to see that happening, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Matty. Okay, I got Steve Robinson. Yeah, um, just on that one, Chair, thank you. I just like to support what Councillor Matthew Ross said. Yeah, we did very much uh, ask that uh, young people were uh, from the Youth Council were on all the committees for performance monitoring. Could I just ask, um, Nigel, uh, are, uh, I can understand why the Youth Council aren't meeting because there's such a, a large amount and they're all coming from all over the area, but are the small youth forums not meeting because there's only probably a, a maximum of half a dozen of those uh, young people take part? I'm not. I'm not aware if they are physically meeting uh, at the moment, but I do know that they are in contact with Mike. Mike looks like he knows. Right. Uh, can, just before Mike says that, though, can I say that? Um, just to answer Matty on the, um, there will be two people from the youth council attending the next one, uh, and and it's quite right that all the committees need to be made aware of this. Sorry, Mike. Chair, if you're happy, I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah. Okay, Steve, yes, they are meeting um, and it isn't the maximum of six because it's, it's it falls within the education side of it. As you know, more than six people meet in schools. So uh, I can say that Steve, Miles and his team are meeting with people. I know one of the favourite places they're actually meeting is Kings Hill House because they've got some large um, outside tents. I can't think of the word. Uh, marquees that's the word thank you um, and that's the facility they've been using so they can be socially distanced and all the requirements because obviously they've gone through and undertaken risk assessments that uh, enable them to do it uh, just just confirm for matty was that the uh, youth were invited to the report that uh, nigel's put together but uh, sadly due to the timing but we have got the rest of the years booked in already with the Youth Council because they're going to happen at quarter to four so that they can come along uh, and do them, which Nigel and Sue has been invited to so that it's all tied up that way. I will follow up about the other committees as well tomorrow. Thank you, Mike. I've got Doina waiting. Chair, could I just come, Chair, could I just come back to Mike? Just a second. Yeah, quickly then, and then I want to bring the leader in, yeah. Yeah, just to offer that um, uh, Nelson Hughes Centre has been open since the 1st of September. So if they want, if the local youth forum want to use that, it has got all the policies in place and they've all actually been checked by Stroud District Council Environmental Health as well. So that building is available if they want to meet in Nailsworth. Okay, Mike. Thank I'm you. speaking Thank to Gemma asking. tomorrow because she is the uh, youth officer for your area, so I will make sure that she's aware of that, Steve. Good. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Mike. Thank you, okay, Chair. Okay, over to you, Doina. Actually, thank you very much, Chair. It's been a really interesting meeting. You seem to have covered a vast range of things. Uh, actually, Mike got there before me. I actually went on a little visit to Kings Hill House today to see how they've been getting on. And they actually opened quite early on in after the end of the restrictions and, and have got classes and all sorts of things going at our exhibitions. One of the first to have any. But the, um, the marquee there um, is brilliant out in the garden. And, and it's fantastic that the, I didn't wasn't aware that the Youth Council are using it. So I literally just saw it today. So it's really nice that they've been able to use... Um, use that as you know we're in negotiations about handing the mansion over to the trust soon so it's good to see that they're they're becoming much more integrated in some, some of the stuff that we're doing good thank you thank you for that no, i half expected you to say that though because i know we talked about it the other day about kings of house which is a great facility i can remember paying my my, my rent there about 40 years ago going to be after we didn't have the rent man anymore we had to go there and pay our rent so uh, yeah, I remember King's Hill quite passionately when I lived in Jersey for a while. You okay. Don't look that old, Chair. But I, 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 I age well, I don't know, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> it's called a camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If there's no more no more questions or observations on the on the performance monitoring, we'll go to the work program. If you want to have a look at that. The only thing I don't see that I'm assuming Keith's gone now, Mike, has he? No, he's still there, Steve. Keith, the only Chris thing I don't see on there is any opportunities of feedback from the um, review. So we need to put that in at some stages. Obviously by November we'd have appointed, but they'd have only had a week or so. But I'd expect to see reports come into us as often as possible to keep 
committee up to date with what's going on. Well, it's going to be March, isn't it? So we just have to find ways of slotting that in. Any questions on the uh, performance report? Uh, sorry, on the work programme? Everybody seem to be happy with it? Because it is your work program, colleagues. If anything you want us to, to look at or ask officers to look at, this is our opportunity. Okay, that's cool. No problem at all. Okay. I don't think there are any members' questions. No, none of those. So just before we finish, colleagues, thank you very much indeed for um, being uh, gentle with me on my first, first meeting. Uh, I think formally we should thank Matty for the way she chaired the meeting for the last several years. She did a very, very good job and made it an easy ship for me to steer into the future. So if Kevin, if you can minister on behalf of the committee, I'm sure the committee will support me on that. Other than that, colleagues, I'd like to wish you all a good night. Thank Take you. care. Bye now. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye.